it's really important to uh, just do your thing rather than trying to become something or do something or copy something. And that's what we've always done. And we've always been able to live with the consequences. And the funny thing is, when I think about why we've had as much success as we have, why we haven't had more success, one of the reasons that we've ended up where we ended up is that the bands that we really liked when we started weren't in the top 10 or the top 20 or even the top 40 or they're in the 40 to 200 range <laughs> and it's not that's where we felt comfortable or whatever but that's just the kind of music that we gravitated towards at the time we didn't strive to become number one or to compete or we didn't do it because we wanted to have a big house and a fancy car or whatever it is it was its own reward and so i think if you start with that basic tenant and then work at it then you will achieve a level of commercial success through your creations and your hard work and your ability to learn i guess that's probably the secret sauce i'm peter mccully that's brad Merritt, a founding member of 5440. the bc band has been a musical force since the 1980s they've been nominated for eight juno awards and four of their albums have gone platinum they're back on the road and they've got new music to talk about and listen to on this edition of Today in BC. I'm glad we were able to connect today, Brad. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. Peter, it's my pleasure. You're a founding member of 5440, Brad, with Neil Osborne, who you met in high school in Tawasson. Did you two play together in a high school band? No, not really. <laughs> Neil came to our high school, South Delta, in grade 11. He was a weird looking kid. Immediately, that's the kind of thing I'm attracted to, weirdness. <laughs> and I befriended him. And it wasn't too long after that we started to go to concerts together. And we go to each other's house after school and play guitar and listen to records and that kind of stuff. We had a couple little false starts, you know. First of all, we listened to his older brother, David's 45s. And David's a little older. So we'd learn these venture songs and kink songs and the animals and stuff like that. So we got good at some of the basics, and then we got a drummer and played some of these songs as a three-piece. So that became an introduction into music for both of us in terms of performance. And then Neil went off to music school in Boston, Massachusetts, and I went to Douglas College for a year. We kept in communication. Right at that time, punk rock was really starting to happen, not just internationally, but especially in Vancouver. I, I started going to lots of shows and seeing bands and got quite excited about starting a band and being part of that. And so I convinced Neil to give up a higher education and come back and start a band with me. So he didn't finish Berkeley? No, he just did one year. Do you remember what you wrote in your high school yearbook? <laughs> well, the, the custom at our school was that somebody else would write it for you. But there was a reference to Brad's ambition is to play lead guitar in Susie Quattro's band. That's right. Did you ever get to yeah. uh, play with Susie Quattro somewhere? <laughs> no, we never. We played with Joan Jett. All <laughs> right. Pretty close. Yes, it was. <laughs> For those who may not remember Susie Quattro, she probably had 15 original albums and she had that really raspy voice. She was a bass guitarist as well, but probably yeah. best known for appearing on Happy Days. But I tell you, that aside, she was a real rocker, and there's a lot of, let's just call it what it is, it, it was a, a sexist discipline for the most part, and these women that broke down these barriers were absolutely amazing, whether it be Joan Jett or Hart or whatever, I think it's a great thing. Neil has returned from Boston. He's back. You form 5440 together. Must have been an interesting evening sitting around having a few wobbly pops trying to think of a name for the band. I take complete responsibility for the name of the band. It's a double-edged sword. Sometimes I get the credit, sometimes I get the blame, right? <laughs> At the time, the naming of a band was the adjective nouns, and there's some great ones. Obviously, the Rolling Stones, right? But later on, the Tragically Hip. There was the Boomtown Rats or whatever it is. We wanted something more iconic, and I remember it was very early. It was probably the first or second last tour that the Who were ever going to do. I think they're on their, about their 15th or 30th right now. And they came to Toronto, and they had 80 foot high letters that said who and i went god something like that something that's iconic and simple and i went okay what about and i had a bunch of other names i wrote down about 40 possible names and then i went 5440 and i went okay so 5440 or fight 
was a campaign slogan by an American president who wanted to establish the border between the United States and British North America at the Alaskan Panhandle. And I went, okay, we're from BC. That's the area they're talking about. Neil and I met in history class. We lived in Tawasson, right on the border. It has some meaning for us. It sounds a bit esoteric, but let's just go with that. Uh, and we did. It would be hard for you to forget your first gig uh, December 8th, 1980 in Port Coquitlam. Were you aware of what had happened that day while the band was on stage that evening? Yeah, Neil's brother, David, who's playing with us now, again, and has been on just about every record and toured with us in the early days. He was a trained professional musician and played in cover bands all over Canada and decided to move to the West Coast. So he had this band, and they were doing a week stint at this little club in Port Coquitlam called the Palomino Club. Monday was a get up in front of the mic night where they would relinquish the stage and people could go up there and sing a few songs. And so we had rehearsed with our drummer and we were going to meet out there and play four songs. And I think we're going to play two originals and I sang half the songs and Neil sang half the songs. And I was going to do two cover songs. I just threw my bass guitar in the back of the truck and I'm driving out there and I hear that on the radio that John Lennon has been shot. You know, it was just a gut punch as anybody that loved music and loved the Beatles as I did. But we drove out there and we talked about it. And we didn't know whether he was still alive or not and went on stage and played our four songs, such as it was, and then found out later that he had passed away. Yeah, it's something that that I don't think about very often. And I don't think there's any greater context than what happened. But he ended, we started. It was something. I tell you, Peter, he is one of the most influential musicians. And he was an icon. And he represented something that was bigger than himself and, and a true artist. It was an incredible loss, obviously, but I don't mean to be trite here, but he will live forever and not everybody does. So that is something. How would you describe the music that you were making in those early days? The band cut a wide swath with punk and new wave and reggae. Yeah, so that's right. And we were learning how to sing in tune, and I was learning how to play my instrument. You're right. We also had these kind of dirgy things that we did. are very much influenced by a lot of the post-punk bands, Joy Division being one of them that later became New Order, and very much influenced by what was happening in Britain as opposed to North America, at least at that time. We were learning. That's what it was. And I think that Neil and I had made a commitment to get better right, to embrace the challenge of learning how to sing, how to play together, how to write songs. We had no fear, which was an amazing thing. And we had nothing to lose, right? Our ambition at that time, our sole ambition was to get a gig at the Commodore opening for a band. That's as far as we could see this thing going. There wasn't any master plan. How long did it take you to realized that dream of opening for a band at the Commodore. What happened was in 1982, so a year later, like I said, we started in kind of December of 1980. We talked about the show that we did on December 8th where John Lennon passed away. And then our first real official show we really called was when we headlined the, at the uh, Smiling Buddha Cabaret on December 31st, 1980. Things progressed quite quickly. We started to get some shows in the scene around Vancouver We started to record. We put this compilation record together with some other bands that were in the scene. It was released in late 1981. By 1982, we were recording an EP and getting that released. We started to play lots in Seattle. And then we started to also go down to San Francisco and play shows down there. But the Commodore thing, what happened was they had the showcase night of, I guess you call it, new wave bands. I'm going to do the air quotes here right now. New wave bands. And it was us and Mauve and Images in Vogue. And I think the other band was called Neo A4. We were the first of these four bands to play. And we did a, I don't know, a 40-minute set of original songs. It was packed. And it was exciting. And uh, I loved it. To answer your question, it took about a year and a half. So over the years, the band's sound continues to evolve. How has the audience and the fan base evolved over the years with the music? I mean, you've been on a long journey together, which has no sign of ending. Yeah, Peter, I appreciate that. <laughs> it will end at some point, but we're a what's next 
kind of band. And we didn't want to be pigeonholed either. We wanted to have not necessarily a career, but we wanted to create a body of work and we wanted it to be eclectic, like all the bands that we knew and loved that lasted, or at least their music lasted. So the evolution started off gradually. And then what we found out was when we would make a record and learn more, almost immediately, even before the record would come out, we would actually be talking about the next record. Invariably, the next record would almost be a reaction to what we just did. So we tended to have these sort of wild oscillations, at least in our own mind, keeping in mind that we had the limited ability to play and write and we're still learning how to do this. And I think that helped expand our horizons and help us turn into a band that has confidence in its ability to come up with music, to write it, and then to present it. Later in the podcast, we have the title track from the new album, West Coast Band, which drops in the fall. There's a real energy in that tune. Is there a trick to staying motivated and inspired as a musician after so many years? Or is it, as you say, you're always just looking to what's next? Peter, I really don't know at this stage. It is interesting. I wish I had a sort of a pat answer for this. When Neil and I started the band, we thought that just being in a band and doing band things was its own reward. It wasn't a means to an end. We were interested in some sort of lifestyle that came along with this. That spirit is still there after all these years. We really get satisfaction from creating and recording and then taking that and playing it for people. This whole West Coast Band record, which is coming out in the fall of this year, it was all written during COVID. And we had these weekly Zoom meetings that I organized that sort of kept us in communication and talking about our lives, but also talking about what we're going to do next. And then Neil started saying, I've started writing these songs and based on our own history, because we kept on moving along, we were, we were reflective. So obviously, when you can't get together, you can't you can barely go outside, you start to think a little bit about your life and your past and your career. We have all these stories, the lore of the band, at least how we see it kind of thing. And it's some of it's revisionist and we all have our different takes on it. But so Neil started to write about this in a humorous way. So he started to put these songs together and it was mostly meant to entertain us. And we had fun with it. And then we wrote many of these songs like I don't know, 12 or 15 or something like that. And we said, you know what? We could actually turn this into a record and share it with people. And so that's what we're doing. West Coast Band is very much influenced by the bands that we saw when we started out as a band. I think it's got a bit of a pointed sticks vibe to it. And they were a big band in Vancouver. They eventually signed to Stiff Records in England and toured all over the place. We love them along with many other bands in the Vancouver scene. So it reflects that. It reflects uh, our origin. COVID is going to be some sort of a marker on the calendar for a lot of us. You're talking about your music pre-COVID, after COVID. People are talking about what they did with their lives pre-COVID, after COVID. It'll be interesting to see what kids 10 to 20 years old, when they're reflecting 20 years from now, how they see that mark on the calendar. It was a pretty nasty bump in the road. You just had to stop everything for two or three years and not see anybody and not do anything. And Oh, that's right. I literally remember looking out the window in late March and out loud, I said, this is the biggest thing that's happened in my lifetime. If you're an artist, it's a profound change in your life. We lost the means to, to make a living <laughs> for starters. And you depend on this community that you've established, whether it be with people like you or fans or the, your crew, your bandmates. It was really something. And to come out the other side and knowing that we've got a full slate of summer shows and into the fall, it's really an amazing thing. It's almost, it's like a rebirth, <laughs> a reset. And it also makes you appreciate what it is that you do. Sometimes it can be a bit of a grind doing what we're doing. And when you can't do it, that's what I want to do. And now I can, and I appreciate it. Prior to our chat, I revisited some of your videos and ran across one I hadn't seen for a few years. The album was Keep On Walking. The video was How's Your Day Going? Ron McLean from Hockey Night in Canada was cleaning a windshield in the video. And he, yeah. he's so out of character, but he's having a blast. There's got to be a good story to this. 
Yeah, so we've known Ron for years, and he's a big fan of the band, and so he comes to shows. And so we asked him if he would do this, and yeah, you can say out of character. So we find out later that he grew up in Alberta and was doing theater and musical theater all through high school. So he's a bit of a performer. Really? <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't so, have guessed it. So he was a natural, and yeah, he was the squeegee kid you know, that was cleaning windshields and looking for some change in our video. And we really appreciate him coming out and doing that for us. Okay. A heavy question. How have your personal experiences and perspectives influenced your music and lyrics as a band? That would be a good one for Neil. Neil is a true artist. He experiences the world, interprets it, and then puts it out there in song. The song One Gun, which was inspired by his soon-to-be wife, who during the recording stage took off to Central and South America to document human rights atrocities, very dangerous work, being moving around in an underground kind of way. And he's concerned for her, he's missing her, and realizes that what's keeping them apart is violence perpetrated by guns. And so he puts that together. And it's obviously one of our biggest songs, but right down the line any song is totally influenced by neil's experiences and what i found when i started to analyze our songs is that the verses were usually quite personal and that the choruses were more universal something which people could latch onto and identify with not that it's a formula or anything like that but i just observed that and yeah consistently that's the way it is. And that's the nature of art. That's the nature of, of music. It started that way, and it continues that way. I realize Brad's diary probably looks like a set of encyclopedias now. So to dig out a couple of stories is <laughs> probably a little bit of a challenge. But I'm wondering if you can share any interesting stories from your time on the road, touring, places you've been, people you've met, unplanned yeah. disasters. Oh, gosh. We were driving across Canada in the van. We were aware of a band that had an EP. They might have had their first record, just came out, but certainly had they had the EP. Uh, and they're from Kingston, Ontario. And so we're in Winnipeg, and we need some snacks or whatever and got to get some gas. So we pull into this gas station that has the 7-Eleven, and we see these other guys in a van pull in, going the other way, and we go, yeah, that definitely looks like a band. <laughs> yeah. We get out. And we start talking to them. We're going east. They're going west in the van. And it's the Tragically Hip. That's the first time we ever met them. And we have this great chat in the parking lot of the 7-Eleven getting gas. And it's okay. Like, hey, we'll see you guys later. And, of course, we played many shows together after that. That is a Canadian story right there. And it just shows you what a nexus Winnipeg is that kind of connects eastern Canada, western Canada. In November of 2005... We opened up for the Rolling Stones in Calgary at the Saddle Dome. Obviously, this is an iconic group. It's a group that I grew up with and loved and still love. And we get into, I guess we'd played some shows through Alberta and British Columbia. We're in a tour bus. And we did a show at a place called Wild Bills in Banff. We heard that Ron Wood was going to come down and see us play, and he did with all of his bodyguards and stood by the uh, the soundboard. We did our set and then met him afterwards and went out with him afterwards and had some drinks. And uh, so he said, when you, we get to Calgary, let's get together. I just got to say that I don't really get nervous. I get excited for shows. But that morning of that show, I ordered my breakfast, and I think I just barely touched it. I was actually nervous to, to be playing with the Rolling Stones and meet them. But they made it easy, I got to say. Ronnie was hanging around, and he introduced us to Charlie, and that was great. And she, he was recovering from throat cancer at the time. And then he brought us into Keith Richards' dressing room and he introduced us to Keith. And Keith was engaging and funny and great. It was a wonderful experience. He had all these clothes on a rack behind him and he was like, I can't figure out what to wear. <laughs> Not that we're going to help him. <laughs> and he had a full-size billiard table in his dressing room. It was quite impressive. Darkly lit with this kind of Chicago blues coming out of the stereo. And then we go out and play the show. 
which was fine. It was great. And then after the show, we get ushered into this room, like a hockey dressing room kind of area with a black scrim. And then bounding in comes Mick Jagger, shakes everybody's hand, says hi, and starts talking with us. And then the rest of the Rolling Stones come in and we get a photograph. And it was absolutely fantastic. I was on top of the world. I still have the photograph. I think about the show from time to time and meeting them and was really grateful for that opportunity. When Today in BC continues, Brad Merritt of 5440 talks about what's ahead for the band, and we heard the title cut from the upcoming album, West Coast Band. Hey, it's the Moj, Bob Marjanovich. Join me on the Moj on Sports podcast on Black Press Media at todayinbc.com. Listen into conversations with well-known athletes and celebrities as we look behind the scenes at these successful people. Listen in to the Moj on Sports podcast on todayinbc.com. You'll also find the Moj on Sports podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon, iHeart, YouTube, and Google Podcasts, as well as mojonsports.com. Why spend hours searching dealerships, comparing makes and models? Find the best of BC's inventory in one place, todaysdrive.com. You'll have access to inventory across BC, where you can easily find a vehicle that fits your needs and gets you where you need to go in comfort. Get in the driver's seat. Don't miss out on the many options we have available for you. Powered by Black Press Media, todaysdrive.com connects you with exclusive new and used car deals. Today in BC is a Black Press Media podcast. I'm Peter McCulley. Brad, in addition to the music, 5440's been active in social and political causes, supporting organizations like Amnesty International and the Canadian Cancer Society. Yes, and the Every Woman's Health Clinic in Vancouver. Yeah, it's what we do. I think that art can be separate from that, but on a human level, it's something that people should involve themselves with as a band, as an entity that has a chance to influence people or raise money, we like to do that. You've also been vocal advocates for copyright reform in Canada. How do you feel about the new artificial intelligence writing and chat programs that seem to be all the talk these days? What possible effect could that have on the music industry, good or bad, do you think? So that's a big question. Very deep. Yeah, I, I don't know what it's going to mean. And obviously how it's going to affect creativity, creative entities. It's already applied in funny ways. And I'm sure that artists will use it as well. And there's nothing we can do about it. It's going to be the new reality. So I think acceptance is going to be important. And then how it's actually utilized. I think people yearn for authenticity. And if something is generated by chat GPT, eventually music's going to be composed by it as well. And some of it's going to be catchy and some of it's going to be commercialized. I have a feeling that humanity will be able to sort this out, right? And if they can't sort it out right away, I think it's very possible we could be deceived. My point is that there has to be an essence of the artist in whatever's created, whether AI is used or isn't used. It won't stand the test of time. And people will go back to you know their Joni Mitchell records and their Neil Young records, rather than stuff that's been created by AI five years from now. So it won't affect us at all. I could see us at some point experimenting with it, but I think that's what I want to say, Peter. I don't know. You talked about standing the test of time, and not many bands have been able to accomplish what 5440 has, and that is balancing creative freedom with commercial success. Do you have a secret sauce, do you think? I think you have to use a, I guess it's probably a poker expression, let the chips fall where they may. So it's really important to just do your thing rather than trying to become something or do something or copy something. And that's what we've always done. And we've always been able to live with the consequences. And the funny thing is, when I think about why we've had as much success as we have, why we haven't had more success, one of the reasons that we've ended up where we ended up is that the bands that we really liked when we started weren't in the top 10 or the top 20 or even the top 40, or they're in the 40 to 200 range. <laughs> and it's not that's where we felt comfortable or whatever, but that's just the kind of music that we gravitated towards at the time. It gets back to my earlier point, is that we didn't strive to become number one or to compete, or we didn't do it because we wanted to have a big house and a 
fancy car or whatever it is. It was its own reward. And so I think if you start with that basic tenant and then work at it, then you will achieve a level of commercial success through your creations and your hard work and your ability to learn. I guess that's probably the secret sauce. So you mentioned uh, you're back out on the road. You've already played some gigs. You're booked up for the remainder of the year. You're playing BC. You're playing Ontario. Tell us about the upcoming projects and or collaborations that you've got going. Oh, we're also playing in Newfoundland. We've played every single province and territory in the country. And that's a really neat thing. Yeah, we have a busy year planned. We just released Smiling with a Cabaret. This is a vinyl re-release. It was never released vinyl in North America before, only in the UK. We have a live album we recorded at the legendary Elma Combo in Toronto, and that's coming out this year. We have a full slate of shows through the summer, uh, right through to the Commodore Ballroom on the Thanksgiving weekend, our annual Thanksgiving weekend show. Around that time, we will be dropping a single for our latest full-length studio record, which is entitled West Coast Band. This is a West Coast Band. A Vancouver band. We gotta make fans. This is a West Coast Band. Coast to coast with a group of guys that have traveled as much as you have. My favorite question to share with listeners is, what's your favorite BC diner, drive-in, or dive? First of all, BC diner, drive-in, or dive, there are a lot of them. Some of them aren't around anymore. So 
There used to be a seafood restaurant on East Hastings called The Only with a neon sign. And that was down in the area where we played the Smiley Wood Cabaret and the Helen Pitt Art Gallery and all sorts of little clubs and places. And we used to be able to go in there and get a bowl of clam chowder with some bread on the side for a dollar, which sort of fit with how much money we were making at the time. So that was one of my favorites. It was absolutely fantastic. The other one, it's a bit Vancouver-centric for me, but was a little breakfast joint called the Elbow Room, which moved around a few times. Really liked that place. Had a lot of the next morning kind of thing, band meetings and those kinds of things. So I would have to put those two as one, two, but I'm telling you, BC is full of, of all three of those things. You will see us in most of them over the next few years. I'd like to thank Brad Merritt of 5440 for being with us on this edition of Today in BC. If you have suggestions or comments, send us a voice message to podcast at blackpress.ca. You may be part of our podcast mailbag segment. You'll find Today in BC podcasts on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon, iHeart, and Google Podcasts.